today. So I'm a gynecologic oncologist. A lot of people don't know what that is. So what that is, I treat women with gynecologic cancers. I do the surgery and I give the chemotherapy. Um, I don't deliver babies. I've been a baby for 10 years. <laughs> so one of the things that I want to kind of impress on you guys are some of the GYN cancers we deal with, what are some of the risk factors and kind of some of the screening we can do for these. So the most common GYN cancer in the United States is endometrial cancer. It's also called uterine cancer. And this is a cancer that's becoming more and more common in the developed world. And there are two reasons for that. Some of the big risk factors are age, so our population is getting older, which is a good thing. But that increases your risk of developing uterine cancer. And the other risk factor is we're all getting fatter. So obesity is an epidemic in the United States, all right? And that's a big risk factor for developing uterine cancer. And the reason is that extra tissue that we all carry here in women will convert a precursor hormone into estrogen. Mm -hmm. And estrogen will stimulate that lining of the uterus where the baby just lives. And eventually can make a mistake, and that mistake can lead to uterine cancer. So that's why uterine cancer slash mitral cancer is really the most common cancer we see in the United States. The good thing is it's usually caught early and treatable and curable, oftentimes with surgery alone. Mm -hmm. and we've also recently learned that endometrial cancer may be associated with a BRCA1 gene. So there was a study that was done that showed that women who have a BRCA1 mutation have an increased risk if they develop endometrial cancer of being what's called a serous or more aggressive cancer. So you don't necessarily have an increased risk in developing that, but if it happens, it's an increased risk of it being more aggressive type. So my patients who have a BRCA mutation and then we're talking about doing some risk reducing surgery like removing maybe the fallopian tubes or the ovaries, if they're older, if they're overweight, if they're going to be on tamoxifen for their breast cancer, which also increases the risk of uterine cancer, mm -hmm. then oftentimes we discuss removing this directly at the time of risk reducing surgery. The other cancer I'm going to talk about is cervical cancer. So cervical cancer, thankfully, in the United States is not very common. It's the most common cancer outside of the developed world, places like Brazil, Cuba, Haiti. And the reason is we don't have any screening programs in those countries. And although we have a very effective vaccine, it needs to be refrigerated, and so those countries just don't have it. In the United States, cervical cancer, thankfully, is very uncommon. There's only about 12,000 cases. Over 50% of those women who develop cervical cancer in the United States have never had a pap smear in their life. Okay? So the reason we don't get cervical cancer is we get pap smear. And we look now not only for your pap smear, but we look for your HPV. And there's going to be a transition from pap smears first, then HPV, to HPV first, and then pap smears. And really, nobody should be getting cervical cancer in the coming years. We have a vaccine against it. Okay? And that vaccine should be offered to both men and women. Right? So I have sons, they're 14 and 12, and 15 and 13. And the 14 year old's already vaccinated, and the 12 year old knows his next, he's getting vaccinated. And the whole idea is herd immunity, right? So if we can't maybe get to every woman, we can't get vaccinated. If we get to most women and most men, we can really eliminate this. And we've known now the more association with HPV related cancers in men. So it's another selling point for parents to get their boys vaccinated. Okay? Cervical cancer again. Not very common in the United States, and we should be able to eliminate this. There's not a hereditary association with cervical cancer. These are HPV related cancers. Every now and again, we get a study that says maybe there will be, but right now we're going to see a genetic disposition. And the last cancer we're going to talk about is ovarian cancer. There are only 22,000 cases of ovarian cancer in the United States a year. So it's an uncommon cancer. The problem is, it's the deadliest GYN cancer. So when we find an ovarian cancer, we find it at stage three and four. 85% of women present at advanced stage. At that point, it's very difficult to cure. We can treat it. And we're able to put most women, despite the fact they present at advanced stage, into remission to complete their, their first treatment. However, most women will eventually recur and succumb to that disease. Okay? Mm -hmm. Which is why knowing your BRCA status and potentially doing something preventative is so important. Okay? So if you carry BRCA1 or 2 mutation, you're at increased risk of developing ovarian cancer. Depending on which mutation depends on how high the risk, but it has 40% of women. And the problem is, there is no screening test for ovarian cancer. So not ultrasound, not the blood test that my patients asked me about, the CA125 test. Not even combining those two things has ever been shown to be effective. And what that means is, catching ovarian cancer when it's early, treatable, and curable. We catch it doing those things, but unfortunately we catch it again at an advanced stage. And the reason is you're looking for a needle in the haystack. We scanned over here with ultrasound, we find a bunch of cysts. Those cysts are probably benign, nothing to worry about. And if we got your C125 and you're under 50 and it's elevated, we're not really sure what to do with that marker. And the women have ovarian cancer and their C125 is not elevated. We have no good way to screen. We do it in our younger patients who aren't ready to do something for carabiner cementation, but we know that it's really not effective. 
So there's no good screening test, and I know a lot of my colleagues in family practice or GYN do an annual ultrasound, because we're trying to do more as doctors, we want to help. The reality is that those are just not effective, okay? So if you do care bear some mutation, obviously you need to speak with your geneticist, and you need to speak with a GYN oncologist about what you can do to prevent this. And if you're not ready to do something surgically, we have two-step surgery. Sometimes we remove the fallopian tubes in young women who aren't ready to lose the benefits of ovary. And there's a trial going on now called the WISP trial. I'm looking at that, which my friend Caroline is one of the PIs in that trial. Okay. We have chemo prevention, such as birth control pills. Right. So a lot of patients will say, well, John, I don't want to go on birth control pills. It's going to increase my risk of breast cancer. Well, the data is not really conclusive that it increases the risk of breast cancer. And we certainly know that it helps prevent ovarian cancer. And remember, we can screen for breast cancer. We can't screen for ovarian cancer. So our young patients who are in their late 20s, or early 30s, aren't ready to have their ovaries removed. Breast control pills are a great chemo preventative tool. Okay? And if and when you get to the point where you're ready for risk reducing surgery, then we talk about what those potential risks are in developing. It's increasing risk of ovarian cancer, but there are some side effects of prematurely removing the ovaries. As Ray alluded to, we have a new medication or a new class of drugs that are called.